In this topic, we are going to talk about leadership and the different factors that influence leadership and what makes certain leader effective. We are going to discuss the various theories of leadership as well as the research according to the effectiveness of these different leadership styles. To begin this discussion, let me share to you some points that I want you to reflect on. Okay, So first, if we believe that certain people are born leaders because of their personal traits, needs, or orientation, then managers could be selected partially on the basis on their score on certain tests. Okay, But on the other hand, if you believe that leadership consists of specific skills or behaviors, then theoretically, we should be able to train any employee to become an outstanding leader. So at this point, we can already see some competing perspectives about what makes a good leader. Is a leader someone who is born to be a leader? Or is a leader someone or anyone who can be trained into becoming a leader? So in this, uh, in this first two bullets, we can see that the first bullet is saying that leadership is more of um, having the right combination of traits, needs, and orientation. While the second bullet is saying that it's not about your inborn characteristics, but more of your willingness to be trained and the trainability of the person. So basically, that's nature versus nurture debate. Okay. And then finally, if we believe that good leadership is a result of an interaction between certain types of behaviors and particular aspects of the situation, then we might choose certain types of people to be leaders at any given time, or we might teach leaders how to adapt their behaviors to meet the situation. So in simple terms, this is what these three bullets are trying to say. Bullet number one is saying that leaders are born, while bullet number two is saying that leaders are made. While bullet number three is asking us to have a more interrogative perspective, believing that leaders are, born, are both born and made. Hence, if you believe that leaders can be born or leaders can be made, then you can hire leaders ba based on their scores on tests, or you can help someone become a leader even if he does not possess the characteristics in becoming a leader. Of course, in my own opinion, the good leader or the best leader is someone who possesses the characteristics or the inborn characteristics of a leader and at the same time he had a lot of opportunities in improving his leadership skills okay because a person may have leadership characteristics but what will happen to those characteristics if he won't be able to enhance and utilize those characteristics and on the other hand we have these types of people who never had leadership traits but they were always given the opportunity to lead okay so the best combination is to have someone who is born to be a leader and at the same time he was given an, an opportunity to be a leader a lot of times in in his experience that's basically an introduction of what we are going to talk about because in the different leadership theories that we're going to discuss you will see that there are different competing perspectives and competing models, and I want you to understand that there's no single correct model in understanding leadership, but I hope that you will have um, greater interest in understanding um, what makes um, someone a leader, and it will help you understand who among your peers are more likely to be leaders compared to others. Okay, so let's begin. The first perspective that we're going to talk about is personality and leadership. Basically, in the perspective of leadership emergence, they do believe that certain people will become leaders and certain types of people will not. In other words, people are born to be a leader. So what are the traits that make, um, that make someone a leader? So the first bullet is based on big five and other related traits. So it says here that people who are high in openness, consensuousness, and extroversion from the big five, as well as masculinity, creativity, and authoritarianism, as well as low in neuroticism, are more likely to emerge as leaders. So I would say that most of these are positive and desirable traits, except that I disagree that masculinity is a better predictor of leadership because it might sound sexist for some of our listeners. Okay, it might be somehow a, a view endorsing that men are more likely to be better in comparison to women in becoming a leader. Well, I want you to understand at this point that 
there are a lot of factors um, interacting that will make someone a leader, okay? And this is just one perspective and there are a lot of other perspectives that we're going to talk about. But nonetheless, let's look at the other traits that were mentioned here. Of course, if you're open, then you're more likely to you know, welcome new opportunities, to welcome change, and that's perceived as good leadership. Consensuous people are hardworking. That's why they're also hardworking leaders. And extroverted are more likely to be leaders compared to introverted peers. Why? Because extroverted people are more likely to have, you know, good networks and they're more likely to communicate with people. That's why they are perceived by their, by their peers to be a better leader compared to their introverted peers. And of course, creativity and resourcefulness is very important as well as your authoritarianism you need to have those leadership inborn characteristic you need you need to have these capabilities to lead okay and then later we're going to talk about what's the importance of being an authoritarian in the office and then of course low in neuroticism you should be emotionally stable you should not be the first one who's going to panic when you experience a problem it's hard for a neurotic individual to be a leader because neurotic individuals are typically emotional individuals and they're the first ones who panic or who gets troubled when conflicts arise so a good leader or uh, the best type of leader is someone who can remain calm in challenging situations and other than that, high self-monitors are more likely to emerge as leaders. And for you to be considered a high self-monitor, you must be the one who adapt your behavior to the social situation. So you know how to manage your behavior. You know how to monitor your behavior. You know how to reflect on your behavior. And then lastly, more intelligent people are more likely to emerge as leaders. So highly biological because this talks about intelligence. Okay, And it shows that intelligence, although it's not the best predictor in different in different areas of functioning when it comes to leadership being intelligent is a big plus okay so this is the trait perspective and i would understand that some of you may disagree with what i've said in the trait perspective because some of you may not possess the certain skills of a leader that is being endorsed in this slide okay so some of us some of us here may think that we are not born to be a leader because it says certain types of people will not become a leader. But don't you worry. This is just one perspective. We are going to talk about a lot of different perspectives in how a person becomes a leader. Okay, so we are done with personality and leadership. This time, let's look at a concept that's still close to personality. Um, this time, we're going to look at motivation and leadership. So according to this perspective, leaders differ in comparison to each other when it comes to their motivation behind being a leader. So what makes them a leader? Why are they pursuing leadership position? So according to Chan and Draska, back in 2001, there are three major types of motivation in becoming a leader. So the first one is effective identity motivation. So these are the leaders who lead because they have the desire to be in charge and to lead others. So the reason why they decided to become a leader, they wanted to be a president, they wanted to be promoted, they want to, to lead the, the classroom, it's because they have the desire. It's, they love leading they enjoy leading it's what they want to do okay and the next type of motivation is called non-calculative motivation and if you have non-calculative motivation you want to be a leader because of personal gain so what if becoming a leader will allow you to you know make your resume look good what if becoming a manager will allow you to have a higher salary what if becoming the leader in the class discussion will give you some exemptions so that is non-calculative motivation you don't necessarily want to be a leader because you like doing it you want to be a leader because of personal gain you will get something from the leadership opportunity next this is followed by social normative motivation and when we say social normative motivation you lead because of a sense of duty or responsibility Okay, so it's the sense of duty or responsibility that is the reason why you are leading. So this happens if you have an obligation towards your company. So when does this occur? Say, for example, the company is family owned and you're the next in line to be the leader of the company. So it's your responsibility. It's your obligation to be 
the leader. Okay, so it doesn't necessarily mean that they want to be a leader. It's just that it's their responsibility to be a leader because no one else would be um, an effective leader if they will not accept this opportunity. So according to research in industrial psychology, among the three types of motivations here, the best leaders are the one who have a effective identity motivation um, in that research result. So I guess that this might differ as well, um, depending on the culture and setting where these um, research or studies are conducted. So we are done with two perspectives, personality and motivation, and there are a lot of perspectives that we are yet to discuss. Okay, so after motivation, now let's look at something that is still close to motivation, and this one is called psychological needs. So a lot of theories have proposed their own set of needs like self-determination theory, like Maslow, like ERG, and this time we're going to talk about another needs theory, and this is David McClellan's learned needs theory, or three needs theory. So from the title itself, um, three needs theory means that there are three needs that we're going to talk about, and other than that, its alternate title is learned needs theory. So unlike self-determination theory that claims that our needs are biologically determined and they are inherited needs, learned needs theory according to McClellan, he says that needs are something that we learn along the way. Okay, so this is not an inborn potentiality, but rather as we grow older, we learn that we have a need for power, achievement, and affiliation. So the first one is need for power. So if you have a need for power, that is the desire to um, be in control of other people. If you have a need for achievement, that is the desire to be successful. And if you have a need for affiliation, that is that is the desire to be influential to other people and to be around um, the people you like. Okay, So that's the need for power, affiliation, and achievement. And your leadership style will differ depending on which need is the most dominant in your personality. Okay, But according to research in IO, the most effective leaders are those who have the uh, whose um, need for power is high. Okay, so in order for you to be a good leader, then there must be a need for power. It should not be low, it should be high. But at the same time, an effective leader, according to McLean, is not someone who only has a high need for power. He also should have a low need for affiliation. High need for power and low need for affiliation. So what does that mean? It means that in McLean's point of view, a good leader is someone who can tell people what he wants to be done, okay, but they don't necessarily want to be like the other people. So just look into your own experiences. So which is, which, what is it that is more important for you? Is it commanding people or is it being liked by people? Because when you become a leader or say, for example, you become a boss or a teacher, a mentor, not every subordinate is going to like you. Okay, if you're if you value relationship more than the tasks, more than the things to do, then according to McLean, you're not the type of leader who's going to be the most effective, because for him, an effective leader is someone who can command, okay, someone who can give orders, and someone who doesn't really care that much when it comes to being liked or disliked by the members. Okay, because if you only care about the opinions of other people about your leadership, then there's a tendency for you to, you know, sacrifice your need for power because what's important for you is your need for affiliation. So leaders differ um, to each other when it comes to the extent on how they possess the needs for power, achievement, and affiliation. Now, according to McLean, how are we supposed to measure these needs? Of course, we can use psychological tests. And since McLean's theory was based on the theory of Henry Murray, which also talked about needs, he suggested that in order for us to understand the extent to which we possess these needs, we can make use of the thematic apperception test, or the TAT. Okay, so the TAT was made by Murray to measure his needs, so they can also be used to measure the needs proposed by McLean. So maybe you're considering right now, if you're a psychologist in a corporate setting, perhaps you can use TAT before promoting someone for a managerial position just to understand who among them has the need for power, affiliation, and achievement. 
Okay, since we have already begun the discussion on psychological needs and leadership, let's dive onto other theories that talk about psychological needs and leadership. And this time, what we're going to talk about is the managerial grid. And how are we going to understand a managerial grid? So it says, it basically says that there are different types of managers or leaders depending on how you possess these um, different needs. And according to the managerial grid, there are two dominant needs or orientations that a manager pay attention to. It's um, tasks and person. So what is the meaning of person orientation? So person orientation is to the is the extent to which you like, the extent to which you're occupied with being liked, respected by people around you. Okay, so in layman's term, person orientation is also known as relationship-centered leaders. Okay, and on the other hand, we have task orientation or the extent to which you want job the job to be done, you want them to accomplish, so that is task orientation. You want them to be productive, you want them to follow what you want them to do. So there are four possible combinations here. Okay, so let's take a look at this. First, let's talk about person orientation, the upper and the lower part. So if your leader, um, leadership type falls in the higher part, okay, so this will be this quadrant and this quadrant, okay, if your leadership style falls on the upper quadrants, it means that you're high on person orientation or in layman's term, you want people to like you. Okay, but if your leadership style falls on the lower quadrants, then it means that you don't really care about people's opinion about you. So that's for person orientation. And for task orientation, we also have low and high. If your leadership style falls on the left side, so it means that you do not really care about the productivity. But if your leadership style falls on the right side, okay, this quadrant and this quadrant, these two on the right, it means that it's very important for you to get things done. You want productive members, you want them to follow orders, etc. Okay, so what are the four possible combinations? So let's take a look at, say for example, this quadrant here on the right, the one I'm marking right now. So what's this combination? They are high on person or they are high on task orientation. Because they, they are on the right, it means that they want things to be done, but when it comes to person orientation, they're low. So it means that these are the leaders, the ones on this side. These are the leaders who are very good when it comes to giving commands, but they don't care if you like or dislike them. So basically, they are highly authoritarian. Okay, so now let's take a look at the actual combinations here. I will present them one by one so first we have here what we call impoverished leaders so why are they called impoverished it's because they do not care about productivity and at the same time they do not care about the satisfaction of the people in the company that's why they they are impoverished okay they they are low on both person and task orientation so they're the worst types of leaders followed by country club leaders so when we say that a leader is a country club leader, what's his person orientation? Low or high? High, because it's on the upper side. It means that this country club leader wants to be liked or wants to be respected by his subordinates. But what about his task orientation? It's low. It means that connecting the dots, he wants to be liked by the people around him, but he is not good when it comes to being a leader. Okay, so... He's the friendly type of leader who doesn't know how to get angry. He doesn't know how to how to reprimand others. He just wants the respect from other people. Okay. Later, I will give you more examples. What about this one? Task-centered. So what makes you a task-centered leader is that you're a very good leader. Okay. You're so task-oriented. You want the job done. You want them to be productive. You want them to submit what needs to be submitted. If they're late, you can reprimand them. You can punish them because their person orientation is low okay these leaders are very high on task orientation they want things done but their person orientation is low they don't care if you like them or not okay but the best leaders are called team leaders according to managerial grid by the way i put mg here to stand for managerial grid because we're going to use this table again later but i'm going to incorporate other theories 
So when we say team leaders, do they care about people? Yes, they are high on person orientation. Do they care about the task? Yes, they are high in task orientation. So this is a combination of high task orientation and high person orientation. So why are they the best? Because other than being a good leader, they're productive, they can, um, what's this? They're productive, they are efficient. Other than that, they are also liked by their members. So those are the team leaders. So try to classify your leaders into this managerial grid. So where do they belong? Are they country club leaders? Are they team leaders? Are they impoverished leaders? Or are they task-centered leaders? So now it's time for me to give an actual example where I hope that you can relate to this one. So let's relate leadership with the different types of teachers. I will start with team leadership. So if a teacher is a team leader using an IO perspective, then it means that he or she is a good teacher and at the same time, he or she gives high grades. And I think most of you like a, that approach. Someone who knows how to teach so, so well and someone who gives a high grade. So that's basically the way that we can understand team leadership in the classroom. But we also have teachers who are task-centered. So when we say that someone is task-centered, they're very good in teaching, yet they give low grades. They don't care about the subordinates or in this case, the students. They don't care if they are like or dislike, but they're very good with teaching. On the other hand, there are teachers who are country club. They're not so good when it comes to teaching. They're not good with leading. Okay, they don't ask for so much, but they give high grades. Okay, so these are the lenient people, the country club people. And most of you, if you like team leaders, I think the most dislike are the impoverished leaders. Why? When it comes to teaching, these are the teachers who doesn't know how to teach. And at the same time, they give low grades. That's why they are our, our least favorite types of leaders. Okay, Because they don't know how to lead people and they also don't care about the impressions of people about them. Okay. So the next thing that we're going to talk about is Theory X and Theory Y by Douglas MacGregor. And according to Douglas MacGregor, there are two categories of leaders, Theory X and Theory Y. And a Theory X leader is a leader who believes that people or subordinates are extrinsically motivated. So what is extrinsic motivation? You are motivated by the lower needs according to Maslow's theory. So extrinsic motivation is like doing something for money, doing something for external validation. So you're not doing something because you want to do it. You're doing something because of something external, okay, like money, um, etc. Okay, so if you believe that leaders are extrinsically motivated, um, Curie ex leaders lead by giving directives and setting goals. On the other hand, we have theory Y leaders. When we say that a leader is theory Y, he believes that employees are intrinsically motivated. So in other words, according to MacGregor, if you're a theory Y leader, you believe that employees go to work not just because of money, not just because of their basic needs, but rather they go to work because they want to grow, they want to be a better person. Okay? So how do they lead? Theory Y leaders lead by empowering their employees. So in other words, Theory X and Theory Y, who among them is a strict kind of leader? That's more of Theory X because they lead by being directive. So in layman's term, a Theory X leader are hands-on leaders. They are very hands-on because they think that their subordinates are lazy. That's another way to say that someone is a Theory X leader. Okay, if you believe that employees are lazy, you're very hands on. You watch their every move. On the other hand, a theory Y leader believes that employees are intrinsically motivated, or in other terms, they believe that employees are hardworking. Therefore, they empower them. And what we mean by empower is that they're hands off, they allow their subordinates to decide, they don't watch them all the time. Okay, so in order. To understand Theory X and Theory Y, let's relate this to the classroom experience once again. I think 
we were able to understand that there are two types of teachers that we can categorize in theory X and theory Y. Typically, older teachers fall into the theory X criteria, um, theory X group. Why? Older teachers are more hands-on. They want you to, um, to, to write word by word what they are saying. They check your output. Um, they're very hands-on. They watch your every move. Okay, if they see something wrong, they correct it immediately. While on the other hand, theory Y leaders are tend, tend they tend to be the younger teachers in the university or in the school. And what I notice about younger teachers is that younger teachers are not so hands-on. Like for example, in college, um, when it comes to younger teachers, they don't like to check works that much. They give you freedom with what you want to do. They don't. They are less likely to give structure into the course but rather they do allow students to work with each other okay so now in order for you to have a greater understanding of theory x and theory y let's plot them into the managerial grid that, that i told you earlier okay so now as you can see i've added theory x and theory y into the managerial grid so why did we put theory x in the lower right it's because theory x leaders are also task centered why theory x leaders believe that their subordinates are lazy they're very hands-on so in other words their person orientation is low okay remember theory x leaders are very strict types of leaders but even though they're strict, their task orientation is high. It means that they're very efficient. They give importance to productivity. They give importance to the job. On the other hand, the very lenient leaders or country club leaders, or in this case, the theory Y leaders, they are very high in person orientation. What is most important to them is to make decisions that will be liked by the many, that will be accepted by the, by the subordinates, by his peers, but they are not so, you know, they are not so productive, okay? They are not um, so efficient because they, what's more important to them is to be like and not really to um, be an authoritarian type of leader. So now, as you can see, um, these are the different types of leadership um, theories, and now we connect them to each other. By the way, earlier, I forgot to discuss middle-of-the-road leader. So a middle-of-the-road type of leadership is someone who possesses a balance of task orientation and person orientation that's why they are in the middle okay so now let's take a look at the outcomes of, or of adapting a certain leadership style according to managerial grid so let's do this from impoverished to team leadership okay so according to this um powerpoint as you can see if we adapt an impoverished style of leadership we are on the lower left, meaning low person orientation and low task orientation. So what would be the outcome of adapting both low person and task orientation? There will be low performance, of course, because you're not productive. There will be high turnover because you don't care about your subordinate. They're going to, to look for another company and there is a high grievance rate. If, um, if you're not a good leader, if you don't care about your subordinate, then there will be a lot of complaints about your performance. Then let's take a look at the country club leaders who are in the upper left corner. So they are high in person orientation, but low in task orientation. So what would be, what would be the outcome of such, of such approach? The first is that there will be low performance. Why? It's because you're not a productive type of leader. Your focus is not really on productivity. But there will be low turnover because your subordinates like you and low grievance, low grievance rate. So it means that even though you're not performing that well when it comes to productivity, your advantage is that your subordinates and co-workers like you. And that's their reason to stay in your company. On the other hand, we do have task-centered leaders and they're very good when it comes to performance. They have high performance. However, there's a chance that because of this overemphasis on the job and productivity, because they are theory X in their approach, then there will be high turnover. They would like to leave their company because they feel overworked and there's high grievance. They might complain that their boss don't pay attention to their rights as a worker. So that's the downside of being um, overproductive or giving too much importance on company productivity and 
lastly, we have team leadership, which was considered the best type of leadership in the managerial grid. And why is it the best? Let's look at this one. So there is high performance because you're high in task orientation. However, because your subordinates like you, even if you want them to be productive, you're not forcing them to be overproductive because their health is also important to you. Hence, there will be low turnover and low grievance rate. So that's why, according to the managerial grid, team leaders are the best kinds of leaders. Okay, But according to McLean, task-centered leaders are the best. Why? Because according to McLean, those who give high importance to power and low importance to affiliation are the best leaders. So right now, you can see um, the opposing um, views when it comes to what is the best type of leadership approach. So what are the possible threats to leadership? What are the psychological traits that you should not possess if you want to be an effective leader? First, there is what we call um, paranoid passive-aggressive leaders or leaders that are deeply rooted or unconscious resentment or anger. So what they do is that they may spread rumors about their subordinates. In your face, they look like they care about you, but deep inside, they really hate you and they express their hatred of you when they are communicating to other employees. So that's a pass passive-aggressive leader or a paranoid type of leader. Of course, you don't want to work for someone like this. You also don't want to work with someone who is a lie like a high likability floater. If you are a high likability floater, then what's more important to you is to be friendly to everyone. Okay? And you never challenge anyone's ideas. So imagine a kind of leader who doesn't know how to question another person's idea. So what if the per the subordinates are proposing something that is wrong, then you will not be able to correct the correct the beliefs of your subordinates or you will not be able to do the right thing because what you want to do is to be like and not to do the right thing so you also don't want to work for this person and of course you also don't want to work for someone who is a narcissist or leaders who are overconfident about their skills even though they have nothing to be confident about okay so you want to work with con competent and confident leaders but not but not for overconfident ones now let's talk about other perspectives and becoming an effective leaders and this time let's take a look at situational factors so this perspective tells us that what makes a leader a good leader is working as a leader in the right situation okay so this what we're going to look at this time is the fighters contingency model so this theory of leadership states that the effectiveness of a leader is dependent on the interaction between the leader and the situation okay and according to Feidler there are two types of leaders okay what are the two types of leaders um, these are person and task oriented okay person and task oriented and how does Feidler determine if you're a person or task oriented he uses a technique by um, he what he does is that he measures your um, attitude towards your coworker by using the least preferred coworker scale. So what is the least preferred coworker scale? What he does, what Feidler does, is he would ask a leader. So who among your subordinates um, you don't want to work with? Who is your least favorite subordinate? So in order for you to to be able to relate to this topic. I'm going to ask you right now, if we're going to group you with your classmates, who would be your least favorite classmate or who will be your least favorite groupmate? Okay, so I hope that you have someone in mind right now. So what Feidler would ask you to do is to give a grade to that person. So I'm imagining that the person who came into your mind is someone who have been your groupmate in, say, for example, a project. But this person is your least favorite groupmate because even though you have a group project, this person did not contribute anything in the group project. Okay, so he's the least favorite. So now I'm going to ask you, give that person a grade. So you can either give him a low grade or a high grade, just like giving grades to your peers in school. Okay, so how does Fider determine if you're a person or task oriented? So let's put it this way. You told me that person A is your least preferred groupmate. Then I asked you, okay, give him a grade. Even though you don't like person A, you gave him a perfect grade in that subject. 
So let me ask you, what kind of a leader are you if you give high grades to bad performers or to, use, to your least favorite co-workers? Are you task-oriented or person-oriented? Remember, you gave a high grade to someone who did not do anything. So you are a person-oriented leader. Remember that a person-oriented leader is also a relationship-oriented leader. So now you have a greater understanding of what a relationship-oriented leader is. He or she is someone who wants to be liked by everyone even though um, he sacrificed what we call productivity and efficiency. Okay, so that's the person-oriented leader according to Feidler. Let's look at the other side of the equation. Let's look at task-oriented leaders. So how can Feidler tell if you're a task-oriented leader? You're a task-oriented leader if you give a low grade to your least preferred co-worker. Okay, in other words, you gave a failing mark to your least productive group member. So the only person who can give a failing mark to someone who did not do well on a group project is a task-oriented leader. If, I, if you're my group mate and I give you a failing mark, then it means that what's more important to me is the task and not our relationship as group mates. Okay, so that's how Feidler was able to know if um, you value relationship over task or task over relationship. Okay, so now let's take a look at other factors that Feidler would like us to understand that are important when it comes to identifying how the situation influences one's leadership capability or one's leadership effectiveness. So according to Feidler, in order for a leader to be effective, these three, um, these three components must be present in a certain situation. And let's talk about them. Why do they need to be present? The first one is task structuredness. So let me ask you, in which kind of tasks are you more likely to succeed? In clear step-by-step -step tasks or in tasks that are very vague and unstructured? So I think most of you would say that you prefer a task that is organized into step-by-step -step and there are complete instructions. So the same goes for leadership. In order for a leader to be successful, there must be clear goals and problems can be solved. Of course, it, it is hard for you to be a leader if there's no existing solution to a problem yet. Okay, that's why look at the current situation. Say, for example, if you're a leader of a certain task force, um, to help alleviate the effects of the current COVID-19 pandemic, then it may be difficult for you to lead, especially if there's no, vaccine, there's no vaccine yet to the disease that is spreading. So that's a lack of task structuredness. Okay. Next, let's take a, let's take a look at leader position power. So this is also important because when we say leader position power, it means that um, the leader must have the power to reward and punish subordinates. And other than that, here's another definition of leader position power. So a leader, okay, should not only be called a leader, he should also act as a leader. And when you're a leader, you know when to punish your subordinates for something bad that they have done, and you know when to reward them, okay? Because those things give you power. Other than that, it may um, leader position and power is effective if you have what we call legitimate leadership. Okay, so which is more favorable, volunteering yourself as a leader or being a leader because you have a higher position? Of course, according to the theory, it would be more effective if you're a leader, leader by the virtue of your position. You're not just a leader because you volunteered yourself. You're a leader because your position is higher in comparison to your um, co-workers. So that's why it's hard to be a leader if no one was assigned to lead. Okay, so it makes you question the power of that person. You, so you would say questions or you would ask questions like, what makes you a leader if all of us are considered members? We did not elect a leader. Okay, and like in situations wherein there is one chosen leader, there is one who is assigned to be a leader, then it's easier for him or her to lead. So this is similar to what is called legitimate power, which we're going to talk about in the last part of this lecture. And finally, leader-member relations. So of course, it would be favorable for a leader 
if his or her members like him in comparison to a leader wherein his or her members dislike him. Okay, so in order for a leader to be effective, these three situations, um, these three components must be present in the leadership um, situation. Next, we also have what we call the impact theory of leadership. And once again, this is based on situations. But this time, what we're going to focus on is what is called organizational climate. So when we say, guys, organizational climates, what we're referring to is um, organizational culture or it answers the question, what is the present situation in the company or what is the present status of the company so according to this theory there are six different situations which means that there are also six different leadership styles in this situation so let's take a look at these okay so why is it called impact theory because they um, that is the acronym for the six types of leadership that you can see on the screen. So according to the theory, a certain style will only be effective in a certain climate. So for the climate of ignorance, meaning a climate or a culture wherein people don't know what to do, they need an informational leader. So during the time that we have to adapt to online classes, no... Um, we don't know yet what we need to do. That's why we need someone who can lead us. And that person who can lead us is someone with experience in doing online classes. Other than that, there's also what we call um, despair situation. It happens when there is low morale. Say, for example, you just had a lot of losses in your company or people began leaving your company. You need someone who is magnetic, someone who is gifted to speak, someone who is easy to approach. And he or she would be able to guide you through a desperate situation. So you need an inspiring leader and someone you can identify yourself with in a desperate situation. After that, we also have what we call situation of instability, wherein you are not sure what to do. So there are choices, you have resources, but you don't know which are you, what goal are you going to pursue so you need someone with position type of leadership and when we say position this is once again similar to leader position power or similar to legitimate power okay so what is the meaning of position type of leadership it means that what makes you a leader is your position in the company okay that's why we think of our superiors or our uh, managers as, or supervisors or as, as leaders they are leaders because their position is higher in comparison to our position. So that's position leadership. Okay, so in times wherein you don't know what you're going to do, you ask help from your teachers, from your managers, from your um, executives because their position or their decision will help guide you through this climate of instability. Other than that, there's also what we call a climate of anxiety. Say, for example, everybody's thinking, what if we're going to lose our job? Or what if our company is going to lose? So according to this theory, we have the tendency to approach someone who is high on affiliation or affiliative type of leader. So an affiliative type of leader is someone who is close to the subordinates. Okay, so in simple terms, what this is saying is that um, during times of anxiety, we approach those. Uh, um, we approach our coworkers who are very friendly, and that's how we look for comfort during times of worry. Then after that, we also have climate of crisis. In a climate of crisis, there's a need for um, decision making, but a certain decision can result in an extreme outcome. So, what's an example of a crisis of um, of a climate of crisis? Say, for example, you're a group of firefighters and then you're going to extinguish fire, a huge fire in, a, in the neighborhood. So that's a climate of crisis. Okay. And in a climate of crisis, what you need is a leader who is coercive, someone who can correct um, bad decisions, someone who can punish bad decisions. So in a time of crisis, you cannot let violators go. Okay, you should give immediate punishment. You should correct bad behaviors so that you'll be able to make your way through the crisis. And finally, we also have what we call a climate of disorganization. In a climate of disorganization, you have resources, but you don't know how to use it. So in other words, you have everything that you need, 
but you need the brains of someone who can, you know, strategize. So you need a tactical leader, someone who is intelligent, someone who is experienced in doing these things. So that's a tactical leader, someone who is very resourceful or someone who is very crafty with what is given to him or her. So according to Impact Theory, your certain leadership style may only be effective in one climate, but it's not going to be effective anymore in another climate. Okay, That's why they say that Impact Theory is very useful during campaign periods because politicians, especially those who will run for president, they try to you know, tailor their speech in a way that you will perceive your country in a certain climate. For example, they can a certain candidate can, can make the Philippines look good or can make the Philippines look bad, and he or she will try to justify his or her run for pre presidency by saying that I'm the right leader because our climate is this. I'm the right leader because I am someone who has experience with economics, therefore I can help our country to conquer our problem when it comes to economics. I am a lawyer, hence I will be helpful in protecting the human rights of the people in our country. So that's a typical strategy that we observe during election periods. You either change the climate or you change your style so that your style will fit the climate and you will be an effective leader. This time, let's talk about another determinant of leadership and let's talk about the relationship with subordinates. So according to leader member exchange theory, what makes a good leader is um, the different kinds of relationship that he or she has with his subordinates. Okay, so the LMX focuses on the interaction between leaders and subordinates and it says that we basically categorize people into what we call an in-group and an out-group. So let's take a look at that. So a leader categorizes his or her subordinates into what we call in-group and out-group. So in layman's term, when we say in-group, these are your subordinates who are very close to you, while an out-group are those subordinates that you don't really know or you get to you don't get to interact with them although they work for your company they don't know your the leaders don't know their names okay so leaders tend to categorize someone as a part of an in group or an out group so how does this relationship differ with um how does the attitude and behavior of the leader differ towards the in-group and towards the out-group. So let's take a look at this. So the, the research in LMX says that the relationship of the in-group and the, and the leader is high quality, while it's low quality if it's out-group to leader. So as early as now, you can see that in-group members may benefit from this high quality relationship that they have with their leaders. Because if you have a high quality relationship, then you are more likely to experience the following. Look at this. If you're, an ex if you're someone from the in-group or you're someone who is close to your manager, you're someone who is very pop popular in the office, hence you're valued by the management, you're more likely to experience the following. You're more satisfied. They say that you perform better or you're less likely to leave. Why? You're so happy with your job. And in-group also engage in OCBs. Why? Because you're happy with your job, you go beyond your tasks, duties, and responsibilities. And look at this. People in the in-group receive higher performance appraisal ratings. Why? If you're close to your manager, then you should expect that he or she will remember you during the time that you're going to receive your performance appraisal ratings. Okay? On the other hand, here are the possible experiences of an out-group. So, an out-group will be given direct order. So, what does that mean? It means that if you're part of the in-group, your leader is more likely to be hands-off because he trusts you. He knows how you work. He understands your work ethics. Okay, your work ethics. On the other hand, if you're part of the out-group, your leader is more likely to be hands-on, to give you direct orders, and he is more likely to punish you if you did something bad. So what I'm saying is that if you're part of the in-group and you did so and you did something terrible, then there's a chance that you won't be punished, okay? Because of your high-quality relationship with your leader, okay? So maybe right now what you're thinking is that you want to do your best to be part of the in-group, and I would understand 
because if you're part of the in-group in a company, then you have a lot of psychological benefits that you can see here in our slide. Other than that, if you're part of the in-group, then you have more say in affairs. But if you're part of the in-group, then you have less say. It means that the company is less likely to ask for your for your suggestions if you're part of the in-group. But if you're the type of the person who wants to feel valued, you want your company to listen to your suggestions, then do your best to be a part of the in-group because there's a lot of benefits if you're from the in-group. And now let's talk about another approach in understanding leadership. And this time, let's talk about leadership and decision making. So according to the model of Broom and Yeton, there are five time types of decision making strategies. And let's see if you'll be able to relate to this theory. So according to this, we have what we call autocratic one and two, consultative one and two, and group one. Okay, so what's the differences between this? When we say autocratic leader, it means that an autocratic one leader is the type of leader who decides without consulting anyone. So that's an autocratic one. But how does it differ with an autocratic two leader? So an autocratic two leader is someone who will obtain information, obtain facts, details from subordinates, and then they will make a decision. The question in autocratic two is this. Will your subordinates know about the problem? Perhaps yes or perhaps not. Okay, Because the main idea in autocratic two is that it's not really sharing the problem, but more of asking for their, for the facts, asking for the details, okay? Because if you're already sharing the problem, okay, that's already called consultative one, okay? And how do you share the problem in consultative one? You share it individually. But the question is, who will decide? It's still the leader who will decide, okay? So from autocratic one to consultative two, it's the leader who will decide, but they differ to the extent in which they ask for input from their subordinates. Consultative two differ with consultative one because consultative two leaders share the problem and they do it um, by group. Okay, so I will share the problem to the group, but the leader will decide. Okay, in contrast, a group one type of leader will share the problem with the group but the group, the entire group will be the one who will decide. So as you can see from autocratic one to group one, there are different types of approaches and decision making. Okay, Autocratic one doesn't even consider the opinion of anybody else, but group one types of leaders will share the problem to everyone and he will let the group decide. Okay, so right now try to classify your leaders or your group members, where do they belong? Okay, try to understand their leadership approach. And finally, in this, the last thing that we're going to consider in this lecture is how the types of power influence the styles of leadership. So let's take a look at the different types of power. So the first type of power, okay, these are the different sources of power. So what makes you a leader? Okay, that is the question being answered by types of power. The first one is legitimate power. If we say that you have legitimate power, then you are powerful because of your position. Okay, say for example, your coworker, you have the same position. Say for example, both of you are teachers. Then teacher B keeps on commanding you. Will you follow him? Of course not, because he's not your boss. But if your boss commanded you, will you follow your boss? Of course, because he or she has legitimate power. So in that case, teacher B will not be obeyed because teacher B doesn't have what we call legitimate power. Okay, so in legitimate power, you're given um, power by your position. Next, we have what we call expert power. Okay, so expert power is similar to what we call informational leadership in impact theory. So when we say expert power, you're powerful because you know what you're going to do. Say, for example, you lead your group in thesis or in project because you're the one who had experience in doing research or you know what's, what needed to be done. That's what we call expert power. Okay, And we also have what we call referent power. When we say referent power, you're powerful because um, people like you. Okay, so... They're powerful because they're respected. They're powerful because people identify with them. Okay, so in other words, 
referent power. You can be powerful even if you don't have a high position. You can be powerful even if you're not an expert. Because you can be powerful by making people like you. Okay? So you're respected. People believe in you. That's referent power. That's why we do have classmates who are not part of the officers of the class, but we like them. That's why they we listen to what they say. Other than that, we also have coercive power. And I think I've been mentioning coercive enough in this discussion. And when we say coercive, they're powerful because they can punish, while the opposite of coercive is reward power or leaders who are powerful because they know how to reward good performance. In order for you to understand types of power, um, the counterpart of this in the ones that we have discussed earlier is what we call impact theory. Okay, so the counterpart of position is legitimate power and the counterpart of informational is expert power while the counterpart of affiliation is referent power. Coercive, its counterpart is either coercive and reward power. So basically, those are the various types of leadership and the various um, approaches in understanding leadership. I hope that with this lecture, you understand why there are leaders who succeed and why there are leaders who failed in leading. It's because their leadership style may not match the situation that is being given to them. Or their leadership style may not match the, the subordinates or the skills of their subordinates or perhaps the climate of the company. So I hope that you learned a lot from this lecture and you'll be able to become a better leader if you will be given an opportunity to do so. So that's it for this discussion and thank you.